Welcome back today. I have Georgie Howe on the podcast. She is a female pro cyclist for Live Alula Jaco. Hopefully I've got that all correct. <laughs> Live Welcome. Jaco Alula. <laughs> Live Jaco Alula. Oh, I, I went through what was on Instagram and in, in Instagram it said live live um Alula Jaco. So I was like, oh, they're gonna have to update oh, I mean, their, could their be. Instagram. <laughs> could be. I mean, I think like with the, you look at the entries for nationals, like we have to do our own na- entries for Aussie nationals, and it's the first race of the year. You had like yeah. 10 different Version variations. <laughs> I know there's probably there's probably still someone saying, like, oh yeah, I'm racing for Green Edge, because like well, yeah. technically it's still correct. It's still, it's still the same. Yeah. The website <laughs> thinking, address is still Green Edge. Yeah, I mean it's probably one of those things it's never gonna change just because of simplicity of like how many mm-hmm. broken links are you gonna get if you change everything over every single exactly. year when you get a different a different sponsor. Different but um, but yeah, like because you you got into cycling from a rowing background. So do you want to like share a bit about how that came about? Yeah, so I was, uh, I grew up in Melbourne, Australia, and I uh, was very lucky to be a part of uh, my high school's rowing program on the Yarra River. Um, so I started doing that uh, in year eight, so I was about 13, 14 years old. Um, and then, yeah, pretty much did all that all the way through. I managed to get a scholarship to the, a, the United States for university. Um, and then in that time, I also did a few Aussie teams um, uh, after, and also after I graduated from university, went back to Australia and um, continued to row for the Australian team there. Um, but then uh, I just, uh, I guess you could say I burnt out a bit once, but just before Tokyo, um, this was pre-COVID as well. I, um, I had a, a pretty poor experience with a non-selection um, for Tokyo and I just decided uh, it's the, it's the bureaucracy is getting just too difficult um but I'm still in contact with uh, a lot of my friends and and uh, I, I still have a very very uh, fond memories of the sport so it's definitely not a jaded experience um <laughs> some of the best times actually um cool places too but um it was I I during growing I actually started a career as a management consultant with uh, EY um in Melbourne uh in their people advisory function so I got to work with really cool clients predominantly in the public service sector so government um yeah my first three years and then uh, I got I moved across to ANZ and worked uh, in the private sector um, from the consulting side there uh, predominantly doing like user research things like that um, but uh, I just started doing that predominantly just full-time after I stopped around and then um, so I was living in a share house in Richmond and uh, then COVID hit and all my housemates lovely housemates and I we all went into lockdown together um, and uh yeah, I got a Wahoo kicker because I started to get the itch for endurance sport again. I um, mm. Previous to that, I was actually doing boxing because I wanted to do something completely different to rowing. Yeah. <laughs> I just needed to, I'd just done the same thing for 13 years. Um, but uh, yeah, I got onto Zwift and um, yeah, really just uh, caught the bug, I guess. Uh, and then one morning I was out uh, riding Beach Road in Melbourne, just uh, when we were allowed to go further than five kilometres from our home. And um, uh, bumped into an old uh, colleague of mine from the Victorian Institute of Sport, Nick Owen, um, who worked with the track cyclists when I, and he knew me from when I was rowing there. And uh, he was like, oh, I've been scheming to get you on a bike for many, many years. <laughs> Do you have a coach? And I said, no, nah, Nick, I don't have a coach. Do you have <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, oh, well, get my number off Rod, who was my sports scientist when I was rowing. And he's like, and we'll, we'll start working together. So that was in a uh, tail end of 2021. And um yeah now now we're here and he's but yeah he's been uh he's got the Midas touch he's been a a phenomenal (laughs) support for me all the way through and uh he's he's an extremely patient patient man I would say um but it was a big big shift um uh it's been a lot of fun but it's uh it's been a big shift uh from a like a life perspective but also like a body physical perspective like uh when I was rowing I topped out at 82 kilos Mm. um and um I was yeah pretty like 17% 17% body fat so I was like there's a lot of muscle yeah you're and very then well, um yeah. and then uh I yeah got down to about 67 was probably my lightest um when I was when cycling that was in the space of about eight 12 months oh so that but yeah so you can't you've gone like <laughs> straight in the deep end and yeah. I mean rowing is such an interesting sport because then you've got weight categories and you have to mm. make weight whether you've got to get oh, I was never like that I was, <laughs> I was I was I was I was a heavyweight rower 
yeah um, which okay. is uh yeah so I, the whole the whole premise of that I had uh, my coach at university Laurie Dalfany phenomenal woman but she was her mentality was just eat as much as you can whenever you can uh, so, <laughs> yeah uh, awesome. and also from a from a physics perspective if you've got more weight behind the hands it was kind of throw back towards the finish line it's um it's uh, from yeah. a like yeah I mean I'm not a scientist but they tell me it's faster <laughs> yeah well I mean this is what in in the peloton like you've got like I think sometimes people get in that mentality that like a cyclist mm. has to be the the stereotypical climber, like really, mm. really lean, really, really light. But mm. physiologically, that doesn't suit everyone. And also, depending on the role in the team, like if you're more domestic or you're more of a sprinter, then your, yeah. your physique can be very, very different to the designated climber sort of person on the yeah. team. But but yeah, I mean that's a pretty big shift to sort of drop twelve kilos in like an eight month. Um, eight month period and you sort of mentioned when we were texting messaging earlier like this week about how you you feel like you're probably still in a lot of ways recovering from some of that yeah definitely bounce back yeah I bounce up back up for sure um, my hormones this is this year in particular have been it's been a struggle I've had uh, the great support of um, the doctors and medical staff on uh, um, on JK so they've been really good my, my personal doctor Danny Castillo has been phenomenal very patient another very yeah. patient man but it's uh yeah it's been a bit of a trial and error process um because it was not for lack it was not anything intentional that weight loss it was just yeah. uh it was really just lack of knowledge um and then um yeah so uh and my body is just dead gone from doing yeah one sport for 13 years and working in one in one way in one capacity like always had a regular period never had any issues in that front um it, the, my body is like has yeah it's, it's a phenomenal thing the, the, the stuff that it can do it's uh, yeah. it's quite incredible but um then and it still is incredible but like yeah I definitely have put it through its paces in this in this shift um and in this transition that being extremely rapid I haven't really given it much time to catch up yeah so you mentioned that like before you, your period was regular is it yeah. is that still the case or has there been periods where it sort of disappeared or been a bit more around? yeah I was um I was amenorrhoid for about two years yeah. um so that being like no period um yeah. and uh yeah this year we've uh, worked really hard to, to get it back um yeah uh using uh yeah we're using uh, synthetic hormones at the moment um to 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 help that along um so yeah we'll hopefully uh things will start to happen a bit more naturally yeah and and i think any with any sort of reds or low energy availability mm-hmm. like it it's not a it's not a quick fix it's not a like and the no. journey to get back to a healthy physical mm. performance pace is really interesting and and so that you you've been a participant in this study from uh, Tour de France from last year mm. which was super interesting to look at the energetics and the energy expenditure and the cost of of cycling and you went mm. into that with an irregular period and hormones mm-hmm. and I think this is something I miss I see a lot in in in, in women but men as well but particularly with women mm. is like oh like I'm performing really well so it doesn't matter yeah. Whereas with with energy availability, it's that whole performance and health, and the health yeah. markers sometimes lag behind. But when they hit, they can hit hard. They hit, yeah. My my old Ryan coach she used to she used to talk about it. It's kind of like a you ever play it have like a Jenga tower. Yeah, like, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. She'd be like you, you're pulling stuff out, you're pulling stuff out, and it's still yeah. standing. But then all of a sudden, it's all gonna fall down. Yeah, and I think for me, I find it really like the sad because I could see how much it can affect people's careers and Mm. prematurely then having to take um time off and weeks and months sometimes even years off and Mm. because of and it can be a combination of overtraining and like underfueling or whether it's intentional or unintentional or not and I've so if you think about that study that you did mm. last year at um at Twitter really France, cool um, it was super super exciting to be part of that actually yeah because I was I was gonna say like it's it's fantastic data because they're um, it's fantastic that's been published as well because like I've been mm. there hasn't been any studies recorded from Tour de France since the 1980s and it's really only, I didn't yeah, know that well not not full studies anyway like there's yeah. a, 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 like looking at energy intake energy expenditure yeah. so there's this one study from yeah 1989 but the way we're racing the way people are fueling is so, so different. different like even in the last five years fueling strategies and racing tactics oh, and- I mean like it's it's just okay. nuts like like the the speed of the peloton at the moment is just yeah. ridiculous and you compare it and that's just down to like these like for instance if we look I mean talking about women but let's talk about like yeah. if we talk about the men like the yeah. the average speed of the male peloton is just absurd 
like the average mm-hmm. speed of like a full stage and that's just purely down to like fueling oh 100 but I mean and I like I've always said this and obviously I'm biased because nutrition is my yeah. my thing but I'm like it is the best it is such a great performance enhancer and that was why mm-hmm. I did my research for my my doctor because I was like why are people like avoiding yeah. this because I'm like it'll make you faster like it'll make you yeah, stronger yeah. it'll make you recover um mm-hmm. but it's a lot of it is that timing is that timing mm-hmm. piece and mm-hmm. I think what was really cool about that study was, yeah, you had the double labeled water, which is able to give you like an approximate, like a, the estimation over your energy expenditure over the entire mm. week on average. Um, but did that come as a shock? Because what it was showing was that on average, you were expend, you you needed about seven, if, if you were trying to maintain weight, you would have needed seven and, and, half. Seven and a half thousand calories per <laughs> yeah. day that whole week. Did that come it, as a surprise? Huge. So like we, uh, I was working with a, uh, yeah, Jose Rata, um, from Liverpool John Moores and, uh, Emily Mann, who works at the Victorian Institute of Sport. Um, and, uh, before the study we're like we're trying to like build together a bit of a hypothesis for like what do we think is going to happen um and based on like my power data um and like they've both worked with me for a few years um they say oh five five and a half thousand calories yeah Uh, it should be should be about right it really came as a massive shock like that amount of energy expenditure was yeah it's on par with the men uh, in 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 their grand tours so it's like they yeah. just didn't it just blew them it blew them away and it's just it I think it's really it's shock it's jarring I think it's jarring data um yeah. because uh, I mean I also it was a pretty intensive process because like yeah you had to like yeah. take I also was doing like my own team's hydration status so I take two pee <laughs> samples every morning yeah. um, and uh and then also record everything I ate um through the photographic me- method as well as like uh, writing everything down um weighing food all that kind of stuff um so it was pretty intensive, but I was eating a lot. Like, I mean, yeah. the, the the food recorded in, in the study is like I was eating, I think, yes, yeah, five thousand calories a day or something, something like that. Yeah, like on average, um, I've got the I've got it here. So on average, your energy intake like during the day mm-hmm. ranged from because I think your average beforehand was like mm. three thousand six hundred or something. Mm. During the stages, it ranged from uh, yeah, four. Four four thousand four thousand two hundred to over six thousand two hundred calories over and that's course. still not and that's still not touching the and size. that was that was still on average it was estimated yeah. that it was about two thousand two hundred calorie deficit per day because you lost like over yeah. like over two kilos yeah and, and that and that wasn't intended like that like I was I was working with not only um uh, Laura Martinelli who is a nutritionist on the team but also Emily um as well on um mm. on how to how to fuel make sure I was fueled accordingly for the stages so like that weight yeah. loss was it was never an intended pace um the, like the intention when you're when you're performing it like trying to perform at a grand tour is always to be in energy balance yeah um to ensure that you can uh, you can perform and sometimes in surplus so that way you can super compensate for the next day for instance um yeah but um yeah it was a it was a really shocking um uh result actually and it but it really just shows that we need more research in this space we need more like yeah. I'm a subset of one I'm yeah. also someone who has a quite a high power output but I'm also yeah. someone who's quite new to the sport therefore possibly my positioning in the bunch isn't as good as someone who's been in the sport for ages so they can be more efficient yeah. with their energy so maybe that would be another variable that we can think about but um yeah the I think what we're the team and I are struggling to find is like is the funding to to do the extra work and the extra yeah. extra studies on the women so if there are any any people who want to fund any research listening <laughs> hit me well, up it's the, it's the it's the doing it as well because I mean, yeah. as you said you did the food for good that, that was what we used in my research and yeah it, it's very labor intensive with the, like yeah. the analyzing and the assessing and from the nutritionist point point of view plus your point of view as well because mm. then you're recording what you've eaten before and then you're remembering like all right how many gels did I have how many bottles did mm. I drop like all those things um but I guess going back to that energy expenditure and how much that you need. I mean, for me, that's like I w- I've worked with quite a lot of pro, mm-hmm. pro, uh, pro female pro female writers, and that's what I would expect them to be expending and needing. Because yeah. if we're looking at your energy expenditure, like anywhere from three to five thousand calories being expended in a race, plus the two thousand plus you need on ever on on average just for yeah. keeping your body alive. And basal, healthy, basal metabolic rate, yeah, exactly. Then it's like, well, yeah, it doesn't it 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 makes sense, but. 
I think it's as women, particularly, we can get so caught yeah. up in this, like, oh, like, no, we've got to eat as little as possible and we don't really need that much. And so it wasn't that hard, but um, yeah. if you're expending five plus hundred calories mm. per hour over a three, four, five, six hour race, depending on how long each stage is going yeah. for, like that, accru- that acute, acute accrues and accrues and accrues and you can't catch up. Like you just don't. You can't. Catch I'm, I'm one, catch I'm one up. To- and once you're behind, you're behind. Like it's, yeah. that's it. Like it's almost like day done. Um, and you really do, like, you really do notice the effects um, yeah. at, at, at the tail end of the race. It's like, if you don't have that, the zip in the sprint at the, at the end of a stage. Um, yeah. it particularly, so like, if you think like, even in the one day races, like race like Flanders, um, if you're in like a, like a six up breakaway and you're going and you go into the line in the, in the last bit and the last little, the last like four, say like seven k of Flanders is is pretty flat but it's just mm. a long straight yeah. big road mm-hmm. um and but you but you've before that you've done like all the yeah. bergs at Koppenberg, Pattenberg, um Kreuzberg, um mm. and it's just been full gas full gas full gas 160 k and then you've got to sprint at the end of that like if you if you uh and it's cold and it's wet if you are behind and you're feeling yeah. you're, like you're giving away the podium yeah and then and that whole thing about it just because it's flat doesn't mean it's easy because... No, because yeah, and, co- and cognitively you need to be fresh. You need to be yeah. there. Um, but if you it, like, we've all had the like the cross-eyed. <laughs> You're like, like where am I? La la. Yeah. la. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And like, it's so easy to get into that state in a race like like Flanders or Roubaix. Um, yeah. But you need to. But then you got to think like, where am I? Like, what are my competitors doing? What what's the sprint going to be like? And yeah, yeah, it's all part of it. And I mean, I was there for the last two stages of Tour de France last year, so the, for the women mm. for fun. And and I was at the top of the Tourmalet watching you yeah. all come over the finish line. Oh goodness, had to get I, pushed. I, yeah. Well, I was like, wow, I've never seen these women yeah. this like the it, like the, I think the thing that struck me the most was everyone's eyes like this really? look, like everyone's eyes look haunted and empty mm. because everyone was so physically and mentally exhausted and and yeah by the time you get to the the, the um yeah the time trial I actually got a video of you from the time trial oh, really? I was like I was videoing all the Australian <laughs> women who, who were racing but oh, yeah. uh, like it's like most people seem to have bounced back yeah. enough like there wasn't like enough yeah. for, for the time trial but it was really evident on that just at the final stretch getting over the tomale yeah. obviously the weather because all the all the clouds came the in mist, yeah um, i just remember squelching in my cleats on the pedals because yeah. you know my socks just got so wet and sweaty from the from the fog oh, but um because it came I, in like it came in it so came fast. in real quick yeah yeah but i, I rode up I, it <laughs> and oh i gosh, rode up it's, it's, i rode it's... up i rode up it before we got to the top mm. and then maybe within 20 30 minutes of us being at the top it was just like clouds and you could barely see five meters oh, which is a real shame because in our recon it was just an it's a stunning climb it's beautiful yeah um for those of us that don't have to race and we just have to make time cut yeah <laughs> <laughs> and it's still but then it's still really hard i think yeah and that's i think female like women's racing as well like this is why we need more research in this space because yes yeah. we've got all the data we've got my data but we've got data from the men but then yeah. the men's racing is is totally different to a female a women's race a women's race is shorter yeah. it's more intense more glycogen dependent yeah um like the that that stage of the tour de france um i averaged 290 watts for an hour yeah um and um and like i had like five minutes at 588 that was and that was just that was just hanging on to the, to the bunch like when yeah. the because there was this like you had i finally had tourmalade but then you had this little lump about yeah 13 yeah. k's into the race yeah. and everyone was like oh, i want to get a head start don't i <laughs> and, so, and then i think it was dsm they're like nah we don't want to break away i told a pfeiffer afterwards she's like yeah we didn't want to break away it's like you bastards <laughs> just let something go just let something go because i averaged yeah nearly 400 watts for five minutes over that little lump fight for the 13 k's into the race but then that yeah. kick-started my hour of 290 yeah. watts just yeah. purely to, to make time cut so i could start the next day with and if you don't fresh feel- legs and if you you if you sort of miss the ball and you're feeling yeah. and that then that means you get to that's you get to the actual actual climb yeah. and you're on empty and so like, I mean no um, one spoke yeah. no one spoke no on, yeah well, no I mean well, we we could <laughs> uh, could see you as you're coming up and no one's responding like no like it yeah. was it was just like a ghost like yeah. yeah it was it was 
it was kind of scary just how how deep everyone yeah. had to go just to get to the finish yeah. line on that I think day. it was that um the video of Spratty crossing the line at Tormelay mm. where yeah. she literally was at like 12 o'clock on a pedal stroke and couldn't get to one o'clock so she had to yeah. just like get pushed uh, and she was just empty I we got back to our bus and Jess Allen my teammate she couldn't undo the zipper on her jacket like I had to undress yeah. her like yeah. it was people were just turn themselves inside out side to side to and then you all had to ride ride coming. down and they were seeing you like this that was like, the worst part three, three quarters of the peloton has still got to come up the mountain and then everyone's just like straight away going down with your whistle you got the whistles and, and like, but you can't see anything I was like this is no. a disaster way to happen I think that that's almost on par that was actually okay it was the Vuelta last year where we, where we climbed could Corodomba, Cordova. I think they did it in the, the men's uh, world the last year as well. But um, descending that, it was similar weather to Tomale, but we didn't have whistles. We just had cows on the road, like big Spanish cows, and they would just pop out. We're like, I was descending with Tanil, and we were like, oh shit, it's a, it's a cow. <laughs> just like keeping your toes. Yeah, exactly right. It's like the race is over, but you know, you still might hit a cow, so be yeah, careful. Yeah. Because I mean, like I'm, I'm looking back over like the the data that you recorded. Because this, I think mm. the thing I love about this study is that we've got so few studies of athletes of what they're eating yeah. in race. So, like there's case studies of like a day, usually mm-hmm. by the nutrition sponsor of the brand and sort of thing. Yeah. But there's not many like races where it's like the whole week or the, like a, a week or the Everything. whole sort of stage. Yeah. So I know we've got one from the Vuelta from a couple of years ago. Uh, and and then, yeah, there's really very little study, mm-hmm. which has every single day of intake expenditure and stuff. And and for me, I love also then seeing like the perspe- the percentage of energy and mm-hmm. or the percentage like the Hydrate, fats, carbohydrates and, stuff, and yeah. fats and stuff because I mean like macronutrients like one of the things I get asked a lot is like oh what's what's the perfect macro percentage I should yeah, be having and I was like well <laughs> like percentages are a waste of time because like if you need 7,000 mm. calories in a day and you're trying to get 25% of protein I'm like you're not going to get 25% protein from like 7,000 calories that's no. that's it's it's a it's a not it's relevant in that situation but I mean during during the state the the race last year you were ranging between 68 and 105 grams of carbs per hour with mm-hmm. i think a total of 450 grams of carbs eaten during a stage mm-hmm. um yeah. is that was that like sort of like more or less what you were doing at that point or yeah more or less like i try to average between 80 and 100 grams in a race um yeah. of carbs um and um it's I've been better at it this year I think um like we yeah. like we we have uh, on our team we've got 40 gram and 80 gram bottles yeah um but most of us go I mean in the classics most of us go for too big calf because it's just yeah. cold and it's easy to get yeah. it in yeah um, but uh yeah I did like I, I do try to average that and I what I did notice uh, I don't I can't remember if it's mentioned the study I think it might have been but I had some GI upset um in okay. stage three um and that was and we went back because I've also got ulcerative colitis Oh, okay, um yeah. yeah which is which is so uh, a lot of fiber <laughs> don't really sit well in my gut um, <laughs> and um the uh the stage three I had some severe stomach distress I, I thought it was because Longo gave me one of her biddens from Trek and okay. I was like she sabotaged me I was like Longo, come on, man. I'm just <laughs> I'm just a domestic me. out the back <laughs> but no she didn't she's a very nice person um uh, very <laughs> nice though to give her me a bidden um but uh yeah, it, I, the em, Emily who was doing all the the analysis on my intake, um, poor thing had to go through all my photos and diaries and stuff. But she went through and she's like, "Gee, you had like this amount of grams of fiber because you had porridge, you had whole yeah. milk, like you had all this stuff." So I just had so much fiber before stage three, and, and particularly in the days prior, that my gut was just like, "Yeah, bro, I can't take all this carb, yeah, and all these calories and have all this fiber as well. Like it's just not going to sit well. Unless you want yeah. to do it along, you need to stop." <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And and, I mean, I talk a lot about like nutrition for me, it's like an everyday nutrition. Mm -hmm. You've got your training nutrition and race nutrition and race nutrition isn't everyday nutrition. If you're trying to get through seven and a half thousand calories, like, yes, we want quality in there as well. We want you Mm -hmm. to be having a meal at some point somewhere yeah. in the day yeah. but yeah. not before a stage and if you're trying to get through like if you're eating five six seven like I said like 13 mm. in total how much carbohydrate like one day you had, and, yeah. yeah nearly like 1100 
29 grams of carbohydrate in the entire day. So like over yeah. a kilogram of carbohydrate in a day, if you're trying to get that from bread, like, yes, of course you're going to end up with like 60, 70 grams of fiber. Yeah. In your um, I, yeah. think it, I think it is mentioned. So yeah, like I think one day you had 54 grams of fiber. And I mean, I know vegan athletes that mm. that they sit on 50, 60 grams of fiber a day and they they tolerate that. But this is where everybody is different. And in a, in a racing context, that, is something that may be creating those um, mm. that upsets and is why you go and have, you're eating rice bubbles for breakfast over the oh, Honestly, TDU this year, Cocoa Pops yeah. and yogurt. Yeah. It was just like, it was, it was a lit, a Cocoa Pops, white rice and yogurt. That was just yeah. a lit combo. Yeah. I mean, like, cause I think it's, it's, it's really interesting for me, like as a, like a dietitian, cause I think back mm. to like, yeah, 15 years ago when I started, like, I'll be like, you yeah, what you're recommending all these foods. Like, oh, that's, that's yeah. really unhealthy. But again, it comes down to context. Like if you eat that for breakfast on a rest day or when you're like off not training, yeah. Okay. It's not the most ideal sort of scenario, but if mm. you're trying to get through a kilogram of carbs in a day, like, yeah, yeah. we want the low volume, the low fiber and we could eat three plates of rice or we could eat one really large bowl of Cocoa Pops and what's going yeah. to sit easier and be less time to consume. So yeah. I think it's learning about the greys and the context to apply yeah, for sure. It is, it is all about the context. Like there's my race diet. You would not like it to fight. I mean, Nick, my coach, he jokes, he's like, I want to eat like you guys all the time. <laughs> it's like the best diet in the world like yeah, five-year-old you, five you, you probably get sick but i'm sure he gets I bet, I, i'm sure I bet, oh, like, yeah, yeah, i bet yeah, you yeah, get yeah. to the end of the week and you're like i don't want to eat rice i want a salad a month. yeah I you're like salad. i want, I want the pokeball. salad i want a veggie <laughs> yeah i think there's a pokeball place right near where i live here in Girona, so i just go straight there after a race usually it's like yeah. get, get some greens and, and fiber into me but um yeah the the race diet is it gets tiresome and it gets yeah. like flavor fatigue is a real thing oh. um out our, our swannies are magicians like they, they sense <laughs> that um like the girls are doing the year at the moment and i know it's hot as well so like uh it's yeah. tough when you like when it's hot and you want to drink but all you got to drink is sticky sweet yeah. stuff yeah um like and but you need to drink it also for the carbohydrates like oh i gotta reach to my pocket and get a warm gel yummy yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like that's uh, it's just not appetizing so um it then becomes a it becomes a whole team effort then around like how do we ensure that these riders get their, their fuel on board? Because I've definitely had races where I've just like, oh, all right, which race was it? I think it was the Vuelta this year. And the last day I I couldn't have anything sweet. And I was also okay. talking to Kristen Faulkner on the start line of that stage. Yeah. And she, I was like, what is you got in your back why do you have a baguette in your back pocket Chris <laughs> she's like yesterday we had, yesterday my team had to go to a one of the the team cars of a, of a I forget which team it was but she's like the EF car went through the convoy and was like who's got a sandwich yeah. our rider can't have anything sweet so yeah. Kristen is just like chowing down at the back of a pillow on someone's baguette that was meant to be for someone's lunch and like some mechanic lunch in the car and so yeah. she's like I can really only eat bread today yeah and even, I mean, I was talking to one of my pro riders this morning and and she was saying how, um, like, she's started even putting, like, maltodextrin in, like, ride food, like banana bread and banana cake that she's yeah. making because... Like, That's a good idea. You can, because, and I've yeah. done it with rice cakes in the past before, but, mm. like, yeah, something that you actually want to eat and then you add something that's got the carbs but you don't taste it mm. and it's, it's supercharging yeah. it, but you get more bang for your buck and it's something that you like eating. But yeah. that, that flavor fatigue is something... And and the the need for and the salty. texture and the tech the texture fatigue as well. Yeah, one. yeah. I think because it's there's so many different foods and products out mm. there. It doesn't have to be just the sports gels. Obviously, in a racing mm. context, you typically want the least volume, the more bang for mm. your buck. The higher yeah. the intensity, the more gel and liquids you tend to tend to yeah. go. But um, in training, like what what do you like fueling with in training? Like real food, or do you use a bit of a mix? Um, I go to the, the convenience store across the road and get some yeah. Haribos. Haribo, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and I also have carb mix in my bottles. Um, yeah. So like uh, today, for instance, I had a, a threshold intervals on my TT bike. So I, um, yeah. and my TT bike's only got one bottle cage. So I have to do a big bottle in there and then stick one in my back pocket. So I have a, between those two, I try to have a hundred carbs in those, in, in those bit ends. And then, um, yeah. then a, yeah, pack a packet of Haribos or, um, or something, but um, closer I get to racing, I tend to be more towards the, the race, the race yeah. stuff. I mean, the Haribo, um, like the Haribo, the lollies, the gummy bears, the jelly babies, whatever you've got access, like it's such a, 
efficient well tolerated well tolerated fuel like a, a fuel like I think I mean like a typical like a 100 gram packet is 80 grams of carbs that's equivalent yeah. to two, like three to four gels depending on the gel mm. size but yeah. I mean it's in general yeah, you can buy it for like a euro at this at the supermarket one euro and, for the home yeah. brand of Haribo I go for not the Haribo because yeah. I mean I'm not going to spend the extra 30 cents yeah and whereas that might be five plus dollars yeah. pounds dollars whatever of of yeah. gels and equivalent but the thing i find really interesting is that like it it's a food that's designed to be eaten over over consumed without mm. causing gut yeah. issues so yeah like the number of people that will just sit there and eat a whole packet of lollies and, and haribo without even thinking about it and they feel fine go on with their day um like it, it, it's just like let's translate that into a racing context of it's yeah. the same it's the same thing or a training context same thing it's easy it's tasty there's lots of different options out there but yeah. this is where it comes down to the like timing where yeah. I think people are like you're recommending Haribo like that's terrible advice it's like no yeah. in content in training when people are using yeah. it when people are needing we need the carbs we need the sugar because mm. that's if you're trying to I think what I find is when people are cutting corners in the training is it mm. haunts you later and then affects your mm. recovery, affects your training performance, and then it just sends mm. you on that just hungry, like wanting food for the rest of the day because yeah, yeah, yeah. your body's trying to recover. Whereas when you get more into your training, your energy is better, you, your body composition improves, and it yeah. helps with your performance. Yeah, you're not going to come home and raid the cupboard um, yeah. or stop by the bakery in the two minutes from home and get a croissant. Yeah, <laughs> which you might, which you, you might, might still do. You might I mean, still do, but it's. Yeah. Um, I think I find that it's a difference of you get back and your appetite is like in check and it's manageable versus like you can okay. shower first. I think yeah. like the the, the, yeah. the key the key point is is like can I shower before I have my lunch? Yeah, like, yeah. Yes. Okay, I feel appropriate. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> versus yeah. like I need food now. Like I'm gonna start eating as I'm taking all the clothes off. And <laughs> yeah, exactly right. But uh, I would like to shout out to La Punctual, Juan at, at, at La Punctual. Yeah, yeah, he's okay for a drive by on the way back. To, to oh, yeah, I agree. Like I have, I mean, I'm in Mallorca now, but like I have La Punctual cookies in my in yeah. my freezer that I'm rationing until I go back to Girona next time because uh, they're feel, yeah, they're so good. I feel bad because I've been like baking my own bread, and like yeah. so I haven't really been paying visits to him too much. But um, yeah. and I want to bring him a loaf, but I also don't want him to view me as a competitor. <laughs> but I think it's, to... it's only going to happen if you start selling it and then you have like a little dry buy and all the pro cyclists start coming to you instead of him then then he might have an issue with it I started when I was up in Andorra people were like oh, she's just like yeah but open up a bakery like Lizzie Holden and you like yeah the general yeah. store would be good and I was like because yeah, I was doing jams gotchas breads and Lizzie is obviously yeah. extremely skilled at um all her like um uh, sweet treats yeah. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I think it, I think I don't want to come up as a as a competitor in the Girona <laughs> market. I feel like it's also fairly saturated, and uh, but La Punctual has a pretty firm hold. You probably, I mean, if you made something different, like I know um, Jess Allen was making um, like uh, in in Easter hot cross buns, obviously for all the Aussies in Girona, yeah. um, hot, hot cross, cross buns, buns, hot cross buns, and also cinnamon rolls. Um, so they, uh, they Jess also... is Je Jess is a very good cook. Mm, yeah. yeah but um I mean so is Lizzie so I mean I was making yeah. Lizzie so like anyone that, that is isn't following this conversation Lizzie Holden has an Instagram page called pocket is it pocket fuel pocket fuel pocket, 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 pocket fuel. fuel and yeah. it's all about like ride nutrition but just real food and and the, the more I think the, mm. the longer someone's been racing and riding the more they start using less gels and and yeah and sports products and more real food into the the training like I've had this conversation with so many pro athletes and yeah so she's got this website which has got all these different recipes of it's bars so and bites and I made the rice her, krispies I made them on the weekend so and, oh, yeah, and I discovered you can you can discover you I discovered you can freeze them as well so they they, they work straight from yeah. the freezer and oh, yeah like marshmallows rice bubbles and butter bit, yeah like, or coconut oil yeah I'm a, I'm a uh, coconut oil I'm not a, so I find if I, I find for me coconut oil makes me cough so uh, I don't I don't like I have yeah. I have a jar that's probably been unopened in my cupboard for a year because like, I buy it with the intention of using it and uh, then I was like eh. I like coconut milk in like a curry or something mm. but in ride food for me it just it uh, just doesn't agree and I think this I th is the thing with nutrition is like it's everyone you find what works for you and, and and playing around and and I think when you test it out in your training then it makes it easier for you to, when you go into your race context to be like I need this this works for me or this is how I'm going to pivot if something mm. happens on the mm. day 
Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a lot of trial and error. Like you have to, I think everyone has to feel like they have to poop at some point to know that they, that's probably not what, what they should be doing. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. Well, that's it. Like, I mean, I, I've got, I know people um, that are 55 grams of carbs an hour. That's their limit. Mm -hmm. Anything more than they start vomiting. I also have people yeah. that have like guts of steel that are on 140 grams of carbs an hour and they do that for like eight hours. And they're like, I'm like, how? Of like, yeah. just, and of like a maltodextrin gel. So I yeah, think. Yeah, my, my old teammate, Arne, like I think she sits around, 46 yeah. kilos 48 kilos yeah. you can pound 120 140 grams of carbs an hour no worries. and and the thing is that i think that people are like oh that's so much food you'll be yeah. still in a deficit because what i, I mean i've seen a lot of data from my pro athlete my pro females mm -hmm. and of like the oxidation and the carb utilization and and when you're getting to that like sort of top mm -hmm. like above threshold you're burning like over four grams of carbohydrate per minute and yeah. so at, at that rate like you are churning through fuel ch and that's why we have energy expenditures of like a thousand calories yeah. per hour because you're burning through so much carbs and it's just interesting seeing how people are tolerating more and then actually now that they're learning and using it more mm. that the performance the recovery is improving and I that's what I see in my practice the more I get yeah. guys and girls fueling and training they get leaner they get stronger they get more powerful they mm. cope with bigger training loads and so then they get it, it moves along and that's been that conversation this year with so many of the women I work with who've been like something this this year the peloton is just like I can't keep it's up just, and getting dropped yeah, in races just... that used to be fine yeah, it's gone. Like the the speed of the peloton this year is just cooked. It's it's redonk. It's just yeah. it's uh, which is so much fun. Like it's just amazing <laughs> to look at to look at it. I mean, not fun when you chew and stem, but it's really fun <laughs> and um, to, to 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 be a part of it and see it progress. Um, uh, because it is it it is true. Like we, I, I was talking with I've, I've talked with a few of my my colleagues um around comparing data from for instance like comparing data from the world of the last year to the world of this year and yeah. it's night and day it's not like it's just the the, really? the, sever yeah. the severity of the racing is just has just gone up and up and up um and with that a certain um, like a, a increased amount of risk which is um yeah. always going to come along um and we're seeing also in the men's racing unfortunately we had that tragic passing of the the norwegian cyclist uh from uh cooper Repsol, yeah um, which is very sad um, and yeah, we send our thoughts to his, to his friends and family and, and of course his team. Um, but the, it is the nature of the beast at the moment. Like the, the speeds are getting higher. The risk, there's more money as well. Um, yeah. and the, and the risks and the people are taking more and more risks. So it's, um, yeah. I think it's fueling in a race is also, um, a requirement from a safety perspective as well because you want to ensure that you've got all your cognitive ability in check yeah. um, to be able to make the right decision. So, cause when you're cross-eyed and under fueled, it's like, oh shit, my world's overlapped off, fuck I'm on the ground. Yeah. I've whole peloton with me. Yeah. I mean, I talk a lot about like, but it's not just the physical performance. It's that mm. mental performance. Cause I see yeah. it with like, with my amateur people who are going to work, if they've done a really hard training session and then they're in mm. slight, that slight la la land at work, like they're mm. not really, you're not really fully present. And, and yeah. I, I mean, I've, I've found that like, I am not mm. training as much as I would perhaps like to, or as I, I did in the past, because what mm. I observed was when I was, I was in doing Ironman training while I was working full time. And now I look back and I'm like, I wasn't like I was probably not fully present. I was training I was before, not, during, not, after not work. But like they were like, yeah, yeah, you're still doing a lot. Um, because but at the same time, you're like, yeah, probably could have done more <laughs> if I'd uh, maybe yeah. fueled more or been a bit more intentional. Yeah, with, with all. Yeah, that. I think it's it's a, it's it's a it's our it's our responsibility. You know, like if we're if we're putting ourselves in the in the confines of a peloton that's moving at 50, 60 kilometers per hour, um, mm. like we need to ensure that. We're, we're, we've got the safety of others in mind um, by looking after ourselves as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, but yeah, I mean, I, I think it's really cool that you like that you got involved with that study and that oh, you put your, yeah. put your hand up and did the work because, but I think something, one of the things that I recommend people do, especially for races, is to mm. record their food intake. I don't think people need to record all the time, but if yeah. you have records of what you've done in key races, you can compare what you did last year to this year and, mm -hmm. and see what worked, what didn't work, reflect on that change and improve and then adapt as the the environment sort of situation changes versus yeah. be like, what did I do? I think I had three gels or maybe I had six. Like, I don't know. Yeah, um, it's a really useful exercise. 
Um, yeah. And uh, it's something that um, that our team nutritionist um, uh, Santiago he um, he's phenomenal. He's actually a um, a protege, a young protege of Jose's as well. I think uh, mm-hmm. he advised advised him. Um, and um, by yeah, why? Well, I mean, he, so yeah, Jose is my my was my supervisor for my doctorate, and yeah. Yeah, we used it. I was like, uh, I was I think his first uh, PhD student when he wow. started at John Moore, uh, Liverpool John Moore's, and for me, so I I was doing my doctorate. I was supposed to finished when COVID hit, mm. and I'd luckily had collected all my data before COVID yeah. hit. Um, I had fifty athletes where I used the remote food photography. Mm the day before a race during a race and after the race mm-hmm. and so i'm in the process of getting those papers published because it just mm-hmm. it just takes forever to get the things oh, published oh um, yeah this this paper took forever <laughs> but i mean the thing that i found it so fascinating to see to just looking at the difference between what someone plans to do and mm-hmm. what they actually do and the reasons why and you, you've mentioned so many of the the barriers or the challenges that athletes mm-hmm. experience in racing because yeah you, i, I want to have that gel it's crazy. I can't put my hands in my pocket to get it out. It's too dangerous. Yeah, it's so con- you don't. Completely. Or like there's a break going, oh shit. I'll, like the amount of times I have had a gel in my mouth and a tax guy, I'm like, fuck. <laughs> Dro- <laughs> open my fashion. mouth, gel, gel. <laughs> and then I have yeah. to follow that attack. Um, yeah. But it's, um, it, it, yeah, there's a, it's, it's definitely a worthwhile exercise for sure. Yeah. Amazing. Um, do you have any final words of wisdom before we wrap up? Um, carbs are king. Carbs are king. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's not. It's been a, a really cool um, uh, and a real honor to to work with the likes of Jose. He is a rock star in the land of energy availability, and it also to to be connected with the likes of, of yourself, Gemma. Like you, with what you're doing for um, for particularly female athletes in endurance sports is really important and really worthwhile work because it just yeah. uh, if I yeah I feel like I wouldn't have dropped that much weight that quickly. If I had had, um, uh, yeah, yeah, like if, if someone, uh, yeah, with 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 your knowledge uh, behind me, um, telling Georgie, you know, you probably it's 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 moving a bit too quick. Maybe we need to slow up a little bit. Yeah, and I mean, and right back at you as well. For me, it's I I love having these conversations with with yourself, with other pro athletes, yeah. uh, who are role models for people who are just entering the sport and and changing that narrative of the yeah. whole like eating's cheating that has been the past, but it actually results in poor performance poor and performance. poor and poor health. Whereas yeah. what the new generation is starting to see slowly is that like okay, well, if I feel I perform yeah. and I'm healthy and I'm strong and I'm happy. Yeah. as well and showing yeah. that there is a better way and um leading that pathway and being really positive role models for like it doesn't you don't have to be the lightest or the leanest to be the most powerful and the strongest and um but fueling is going to ensure you perform and recover and have a better performance and health as well yeah you're like you gotta have a good life yeah. Far out. like i mean sport is great being an athlete's fantastic and it's a huge privilege yeah but I also want to, you know, for me, like relationships are my currency and yeah. I want to ensure that I'm wealthy in that aspect. So, yeah. um, and so yeah. I've got to have the energy in order to cultivate that. Yeah. And, and, and you can go out and have a pizza and have a burger or whatever it is that you fancy. You're yeah, allowed to have a beer. They're, they've done yeah. studies. The German <laughs> men's eight, fastest men's eight in the world for a period yeah. of time, they would finish their hard sessions and have a pint of Guinness. Yeah. That's it. Like, I mean, I, I, I'd be like, I'd be like, let's have have it in the day, like where possible. But yeah, like, it, it, and it's part of that celebration. It's part of yeah. that. Um, like, food is more than just numbers and nutrients. It's it's health. Yeah. It's happiness. It's social. And and yeah, the alcohol and the celebrations are part of it. Like, and when mm. you know how it affects you, you can be like, yeah, two is probably going to affect my recovery, but one with food with hydration, it's going to. Yeah mentally make me happy physically make yeah. me happy as well yeah i mean it's just like it's we you gotta live like it's yeah. like we're yeah. we get to live on this wonderful little blip in the universe and for a finite period of time gotta have some fun yeah absolutely and no i think it's great to, to have people sort of showing you that there there is a balance it doesn't have to be really extreme eating on your own mm-hmm. only rabbit food like you can have that variety of foods and have the croissant yeah. and incorporate into your everyday life and still perform balance really well as well so yeah. i think really... um the uh there's a my classics degree is going to come out now 
Aristotle had a had a term called the golden mean, where it's like you can't be in excess of anything because then you'll never be excellent in that one thing in any, in anything essentially. So it's just like you've mm-hmm. got to have a, a lovely spread or, or a balance, or the good he referred to it as the golden mean, um, in order to truly achieve a virtuous life. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Excellent. Well, on that note, thanks again, yeah. and um, no worries. Thank you. I'll see you again soon. See you soon. <laughs>